Good evening. I now call the April 27th meeting of the Wallingford Swarthmore School Board to order. Uh, in opening, I will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I would like to start this evening by asking Ms. Klingerman for a roll call. Good evening. When I call your name, uh, please say present. Dr. Grandy. Present. Mrs. Wachtman. Present. Mr. Cutis. Present. Dr. Downey. Present. Mr. Ballas. Present. Ms. Semino. Present. Dr. Huff. Present. Mrs. Lentz. Present. Mr. Orsetti. Present. Uh, Superintendent Palmer. Present. And Mr. Berman. Present. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Klingerman. So we have uh, nine voting members uh, participating in our meeting this evening. Um, I do wanna start um, with a, uh, as we did at our last meeting, uh, a suspension of policies to enable us to meet remotely this evening. Uh, due to the current health crisis and the governor's closure order, all members of the Wallingford Swarthmore School District Board of School Directors will be participating remotely. However, the board's policies impose some requirements for remote participation that are inconsistent with the governor's order. Therefore, I move to adopt the attached resolution to suspend. Uh, do I have a second for this motion? Marilyn has a second, Mrs. Walkman. Uh, I heard a second from uh, Marilyn. Uh, uh, Ms. Klingerman, can we have a roll call vote? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Mr. Ballas, how do you vote? Mr. Ballas? Aye. Ms. Semino? Aye. Dr. Downey? Aye. Dr. Huff? Aye. Mr. Cutis? Aye. Mrs. Lentz? Aye. Mr. Orsetti? Aye. Mrs. Wachtman? Kelly? I'm back. I was disconnected. Can you please repeat? Uh, yes. Dr. Grandy? Yeah, so we're voting, Kelly, on a um, uh, to, suspend to suspend policies. Yes, to Great. enable us to yes. meet remotely this evening. And Ms. Klingerman was going through the roll call, and we okay. had just gotten to your name. Yes. yes, I. Thank you. Thanks, Mrs. Walkman. Dr. Grandy? Aye. Okay, thank you. Okay, the vote passes nine to zero. The suspensions are in place. Um, it is worth repeating, um, you know, as I mentioned at our last meeting, that under the procedures we're using uh, for the meeting this evening in which the suspensions now permit, uh, members of the public wishing to address the board have been and continue to be encouraged to call 610-892-3470, extension 1102, to leave recorded comments for the board subject to a three minute time limit. Uh, any comments left prior to five o'clock today um, have been transcribed and are made available to the board. Um, those comments are acknowledged at the appropriate time during the meeting. Anything left after five o'clock but prior to the end of the meeting will still be transcribed and distributed to the board and made a part of the record, uh, but will not uh, be able to be acknowledged during the meeting uh, this evening. Uh, so with that, um, I want to move to uh, our next item on the agenda, which is our student representatives report. Uh, so Ms. Sharman. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to preface my report by saying that I am so grateful for everything that the district has done 
uh, these past few weeks to make the shift to online learning really uh, smooth and that there's a lot of things that have been working really well. Um, for example, all of the teachers are really readily accessible. Uh, you can email them and set up Zoom meetings and they'll respond like within the hour, which is great. Um, they've also been providing a lot of forms for feedback so you can tell your teacher if you think there's too much work or too little work or anything like that. Um, and a lot of teachers put out video lectures. So uh, instead of a Zoom session that you can go to, you can just watch the video, which is really nice. And you can get your work done at your own pace on your own time, which is really great. Um, but with all that being said, there are some things that I think are a little problematic. And the biggest of which is that there's just an overwhelming amount of work. So I spend typically about four hours a day doing homework, which is kind of insane. And it might not sound like a lot because it's a lot less than a normal school day, but online learning um, shouldn't really be compared to regular school because at school you're engaging actively with your teacher, you have your classmates to talk to, um, and it's very different. But with online learning, I'm just sitting in, like in the same place for four hours a day doing work and it's very exhausting. So uh, I think that that could maybe change a little bit. And some of the consequences of having too much work are that I can't spend as much time with my family as I would like because my parents don't come home until the late afternoon and I'd like to spend the evening with them. But a lot of the time I can't because I have homework to do. Um, I've also talked to a lot of kids who said that they're still staying up late to finish homework, which is kind of appalling considering the district's goal this year of um, maintaining healthy sleep schedules and cutting back on homework to make that happen. Um, and also sometimes you have so much homework that you end up not even learning anything because you're just looking up the answers to try and finish the assignment on time rather than taking the time to ask your teacher for help and to uh, actually learn the information. Um, and people have also said that there's a lot of busy work and not a lot of teaching happening in their classes, which leads to uh, additional stress. And it leads to a lot of students kind of thinking of online learning as pointless because they're not learning, they're just trying to look up answers. So if we had less work that's more um, manageable, then I think that the teaching could be a lot more efficient. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to talk about was the idea of a pass-fail system, which I know a lot of people have brought up to the administration, and I don't know what specific reasons the uh, administration has against a pass-fail, but in my opinion, it would just be very helpful because um, I don't think that students should be held to the same standards as they were before uh, this all happened because everyone is under incredible amounts of stress with the pandemic. You're worrying about your health. You're worrying about you know things like food and the safety of your loved ones and it's kind of silly to put the additional stress of maintaining grades and your GPA on top of all of that. Um, and I talked to a friend of mine whose school has shift to a, shifted to a pass-fail system and he said that it's alleviated a lot of stress from their students and even the teachers have started to cut back on work and set more realistic expectations as a result of the pass-fail system um, and I think that it would be worthwhile to implement it here in, in the Wallingford Swarthmore School District. And that is all I have to say. So thank you. Sorry, now I was muted. Um, thank you, Sama, uh, for that report and bring up a lot of important issues. I know um, certainly there's been a tremendous uh, upheaval, I think, in the lives of so many students uh, throughout all levels of, of education through the district in terms of uh, what, what um, students are having to manage both within school and outside of school as well. So we appreciate you sharing those thoughts and we'll certainly come back to some discussions on some of these issues as we move down in the agenda uh, and also get an update on remote flexible instruction um, from the administration. So thank you again. Uh, so next we have the, the superintendent's report, uh, Dr. Palmer. Thank you, Dr. Grandy. First, I'd like to comment on items on our agenda this evening. Under the personnel section that even though our schools are physically closed, we have been very actively conducting virtual interviews for all of our vacancies. You will see recommendations for appointments and changes of assignment to support filling positions that will be available at the end of our school year due to retirements. In addition, you'll also see two administrative changes of assignment in the curriculum department and the technology department. Currently, we have two administrative vacancies, and we've used this opportunity to restructure both departments. The changes of assignment for the Director of Education, 
and the network and site services administrator are directly tied to the restructuring. And finally, as I shared with the community late last week, tonight's agenda includes a recommendation to appoint Dr. Gregory Hilden as principal of Strathaven High School, effective July 1st. Under the curriculum section, there are items of note that are in direct response to the governor's closing of school as a result of COVID-19. The first item waives specific graduation requirements for any students who were enrolled in our academic or other learning opportunities for the spring of 2020 that would have permitted that student to graduate in June and that the administration believed the student would graduate in June. PDE provides the district with guidelines and they are telling us relative to graduation or the promotion of students to be as flexible and as understanding of the child's unique circumstances and look at where that child's progress was as of March 13th. Was it reasonably expected that that child would move to the next grade or be able to graduate? The second item addresses our grading practices. And I think Ms. Sharman will be very happy with what we are proposing this evening for the board to consider. <laughs> We've had very significant conversations for what grading should look like at the elementary, the middle and the high school level. And what we are presenting for board action this evening is what we believe is the most fair way to continue grading through the end of the 1920 school year. Dr. Citarelli Jones will highlight this in our first focus topic this evening. So moving on to the finance section, I will first say that this is the time of year where the finance agenda is quite large. Several items to note. The first is our nutrition group food service renewal. When the nutrition group was suggests or selected as our food service vendor um, in the 18-19 school year, we knew that we could renew the, agre the um, agreement four possible times. Tonight's agenda is the second of those four possible renewals. And I will note that there is no increase in meal prices included in the renewal. Also included on the agenda are two items that should be taken together. One is Synovia Solutions and the other is TransFinder Market Connect. When viewing these items together, they will allow the district to have GPS locators on all of our buses. The Synovia systems will work directly with TransFinder, which is our transportation software, and it will provide live and historical tracking, mapping and routing, location updates, and much more. Based on the feedback that we've received this year, we believe it will be a welcome addition to our parents and our students. Also under the finance section is a recommendation for Wallingford Swarthmore School District to refinance our general obligation bonds, specifically our Series 2012, Series A, with Delaware Valley Regional Finance Authority, also known as DelVal. To refresh everyone's memory, at our February 24th board meeting, Brad Remick, the Managing Director of PFM Financial Advisors, presented an overview of our bond refunding opportunity that was allowable under a parameters resolution issued by the board back in October of 2017. Since our February meeting, the bond market has been quite volatile with wide fluctuations. In the meantime, a different opportunity became available. DelVal has an attractive bond pool and by refinancing our 2012 bonds with DelVal, the district will actually save more than what Mr. Remick presented in February. As a point of reference, Mr. Remick was anticipating possible savings in the $500,000 range, and the DelVal currently estimated savings are approximately $1 million. Tonight's action authorizes the DelVal resolution to finalize the refinancing process, and our settlement would occur the first week of June. Also on our finance section, as we are still going with several more items, our 2016 technology lease has come to its end and we need to replace it at this time to support our technology renewal cycle. Ms. Figura, Mr. King and Mr. Citroni will be highlighting this in our second focus topic this evening. Moving on to several items that I will put under our capital projects. 
Arts on February 24th, which seems like a very, very long time ago now, Mr. Abbott presented our five-year capital projects plan. Included on this agenda are several items that appear on the plan. Specifically, Crabtree, Rohrbaugh, and Associates will develop bid specifications for Strathaven High School entrances project, and S.J. Thomas will be the vendor that will install flooring in SRS's main lobby and the vestibule area and Strathaven High School modular classrooms. And finally, uh, on the agenda, and perhaps the most important item on the agenda is a contract with 2020 Visual Media. With Governor Wolf's social distancing orders in place, it is highly unlikely that Strathaven High School can take place in person as originally planned. As such, we would like to make contingency plans for a virtual graduation. It pains me to say virtual graduation, so I would like to reiter reiterate something that Ms. Lapiria said to our senior class cabinet today. If there is any way we can have an in-person graduation, we will pull out all stops to make it happen. So moving beyond our agenda, I'd like to remind everyone that there is still time to complete the 2020 census if you have not already done so. Counting every one of our residents, including non-citizens, is critically important. You being counted impacts everything from how many representatives Pennsylvania will have in Congress to the amount of federal funding we receive for our schools, police, fire, and countless other public services. Please stand up and be counted. You should have received a letter from the U.S. Census Bureau. If you haven't already done so, please fill out the form and return it. Alternatively, you can complete the census form electronically or print a paper form from the census website at 2020census.gov. It will take you less than 10 minutes of your time, and we all thank you. I'd like to remind everyone about our food service program. Our food service program is operating right now as an open site where all children 18 years and under in the community receive free meals. Our program operates from 10 a.m. to noon, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Friday from the Brookhaven Road entrance of Strathaven High School. Breakfast and lunch meals are available to all children 18 years and under. This program is not limited to WSSD students. All children are able to receive 14 meals in total per week. And if you'd like more information about the program, we ask you to visit our website under the COVID-19 tab. And before I close, I would like to share our heartfelt appreciation to our parents for their feedback and continued support as we partner in providing flexible instruction to our students to our students for their enthusiasm and excitement, even in these difficult times. To our awesome faculty, administration, and staff for doing their very best for our students, our families, and each other. And to all individuals on the front line for keeping all of us safe. On behalf of all of us at the Wallingford Swarthmore School District, a very sincere thank you to all of you from all of us. And Dr. Grandy, that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Um, so that takes us to the point in the agenda for board announcements. I do want to announce that since our last meeting, the board did meet in executive session on April 22nd to discuss litigation and a personnel discussion regarding specific employees and met again this evening prior to this meeting to discuss contract negotiations. Uh, and so that takes us next to our focus topics this evening. We have two on the agenda, an update on remote flexible instruction and our technology leases, as Dr. Palmer just mentioned. Uh, so I'll ask Dr. Palmer to introduce our first presenter. Well, we had at our last board meeting, Dr. Citarelli jones giving us a behind the scenes look at flexible instruction. Tonight, she is back with us. And I'd like to have everybody think, well, this is the next step. We asked our parents, we asked our kids, we've had feedback from teachers, what's working, what's not, and what we've said all along is that our flexible instruction plan would be a work in progress. 
So Dr. Citarelli Jones is back with us tonight to take us through kind of that next phase based on the feedback that we've received. So Dr. Jones, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And that way I can share with you my PowerPoint as well. So good evening to everybody out there. Um, I am here tonight to share a number of educational updates for the Wallingford Swarthmore School District. But I thought what I would do tonight is I wanna begin by setting the context for these updates. Because teaching and learning in an emergency distance format is not ideal. Ideal learning for students is being in the schools. It's seeing their teachers every day. It's learning with their friends. It's experiencing the activities and socialization that happen alongside the learning. And for teachers, the ideal is seeing the students in the building every day. It's the ability to modify lessons in real time. It's the ability to give face-to-face -face immediate feedback. It's seeing changes in student behavior as soon as it happens. It means collaborating with colleagues who are just one classroom door away. And when there are technology initiatives, it's receiving a full complement of technology training as that technology is phased in. Emergency distance learning is not any of these things. Emergency distance learning did not allow us to spend weeks preparing for this new reality. It demands immediate answers to questions no one ever imagined facing. That is our current context. I really have worked in when I counted up four districts in three different counties in the 28 years that I've been in education. And I really wanna echo what I said two weeks ago about this particularly amazing staff. They are working beyond capacity in circumstances for which we had no warning in an emergency learning environment that nobody wanted. I am proud that they continue to go the distance for our students and community every day. And Feedback such as what we received tonight from Ms. Sharman, our, our student representative, that really helps us move our efforts forward in continuous improvement. And so I wanna thank you for your candor tonight particularly. So keeping this context in mind, I would like to guide you through some updates related to the next phase of our education plan as Dr. Palmer indicated. They answer our most immediate questions, but we are fully aware that there are more questions that need answers. We are discussing them as well. And as soon as we have answers to those questions, we will provide answers. And then we're gonna begin again with the next set of questions and so on. So tonight I will be sharing information with you about grading and report cards, the upcoming interactive Zoom sessions with students and some overall data from the parent feedback survey. So the first thing I'm gonna get into is our grading and report cards, what our plans are right now. And I'm gonna start first with the elementary school. Elementary teachers are going to continue to assign and give feedback on student progress through what we call formative assessments. Those are assessments where the activities and assignments indicate a student's understanding of the learning outcomes designated by the district and the Pennsylvania Department of Education. So using that formative data, teachers plan their upcoming lessons and activities in order to close the gaps in learning or to engage students in new way of thinking and often to determine where reteaching needs to occur. This formative data planning is an essential component of the teaching and learning cycle. Teachers are expected to evaluate student learning regularly as part of the implementation of the WSSD program of study, whether we are face-to-face -face or in an online format. So an update in terms of our March parent-teacher conferences that were not held because of the COVID pandemic. Our parent-teacher conferences will not be held this spring 2020 semester. These conferences involve the preparation work of many people, including our classroom teachers, but also the co-teachers, special education case managers, the reading specialists, the administrators, and all of that takes considerable time, even when we are in a face-to-face -face environment. So to now prepare and hold conferences about March data in, in a suspended instruction mode, which was what we would normally do, where teachers would have in service days to prep, and then they would be meeting with teachers, which means students are not in session. We don't believe that right now, having multiple days of suspended instruction to coordinate and hold those conferences is in the best interest of our students. So instead, we're gonna look forward to our grades as a way to show progress to the parents. 
So grades for our elementary folks will be based on the progress of the students prior to March 13th, plus the existing data regarding a student being on target to meet the standards, in other words, that formative assessment I spoke about, and all of what we are gleaning from the flexible instruction window. So through feedback and analysis of those three data points, the elementary teachers will assign progress updates to parents in the June report card, and they will indicate either a two, which means moving toward grade level expectations, or a three, which means meeting grade level expectations. In the area of specials, which in elementary is music, physical education, and art, the students will receive a three, which is the equivalent of a passing grade. In order to receive this score, students will be asked to submit two artifacts by the last student day that show a sample of their activities related to things like physical education and recreation, artwork, music appreciation, practice. Options may include a log of activities, a summary of what they're most proud of, a recording of a song, a picture of artwork, just basic samples of what they've been working on. These options will be developed and shared by our special, special area teachers in the next week. So I'm going to move on to middle school. For our middle school, our teachers will also continue to assign and give feedback on student progress through formative assessments, but they will also be doing short summative assessments as well. So let me tell you what the summative assessment really means. A summative assessment is used as an analysis of the learning outcomes in a particular unit of study. And as such, they really provide meaningful data regarding a student's progress prior to advancing to a new concept. These can take the form of a quiz, they can be a final project, but they are often the culmination of student work in a particular area. So as we start to look at the, the report card for our middle school students, they are gonna receive a letter grade as they have in the past in their core subject areas. So what we're looking at there is for um, all of our core subject areas, we are looking at letter grades at the middle school. In special areas, however, which in the middle school is music, PE, art, computer science, family consumer science and technology education. Those students who complete their assignments will receive a P as a passing grade. At the high school, the fourth quarter assignments will continue to be graded as determined by teacher rubrics and guidelines and expectations. We will not be having final exams for students in the spring of 2020. Instead, what we're looking at is to combine the third and fourth marking period they'll be weighted equally and they'll be averaged to assign a second semester grade. There are students who take year long classes, for example, um, in language arts and in biology. So when they have them, all four quarters will be weighted equally and they will be averaged for a final grade. So on report cards, the students will receive a letter grade similar to the past, but they could also with the consent of a parent elect to participate in the pass fail option. In that case, the student and the parent will waive the grade, a decision that once made will be permanent. So details on the process for electing to waive a letter grade will be forthcoming. However, the FAQs that will be released tonight after this meeting will give additional considerations and details regarding the election of pass fail for the spring semester courses. I'm gonna take you through a few of those right now. So a pass means that students have earned at least a 60% in the course by completing the required assignments or tests or quizzes, written work, projects, and they will be awarded credit for the course. A pass will not positively or negatively affect a student's overall grade point average or GPA, but it does indicate that the student has met criteria to earn the credit. Students in grades nine through 11 will have from June 5th to the 30th to complete their waiver and seniors will have from May 18th to the 29th to complete the waiver. All recommendations for courses that begin in the fall were completed prior to March 13th of 2020. So for grades that are earned in spring 2020 only, students will move to the course they were originally recommended to take regardless of how their grades are recorded. Students may also wish to research colleges, universities, and other post-secondary programs to review their grading policies. And students who are not sure which option to choose may seek consultation from their school counselor. However, the decision will ultimately be left to the student and the family. And I just wanna say a final word about pass fail. The decision to convert a grade to a pass should not be considered lightly. While many academic institutions have altered their grading practices in light of the global pandemic, the district cannot guarantee how all post-secondary programs will consider a P. 
when granting admission or even merit scholarships. So those are some things that the families and the students will have to keep in mind as they consider whether or not to waive letter grades and opt in to the pass fail system. So over a little, maybe two weeks ago, we administered a survey to our parents and we wanted to get an immediate snapshot of the parent and student experience thus far. So there was a really quick turnaround for that. Still, we had almost 1200 parent responses. So we know that data and public opinion can change rapidly. So it was important to get a data set to start with. And from there, we could continue to get additional feedback on subsequent surveys for comparison. For example, we have student surveys that are currently taking place at the middle and high school so that we can get a student view of flexible instruction. So I wanna take this time to really say how much I appreciate the responses that we received on the surveys and really the constructive feedback in the open-ended section. I think all feedback really helps us to work together as a community so that we can take the next steps in the student engagement during this emergency distance learning format. So I'm gonna go through some of the overarching data for K through 12 and just know that the principals and the teachers are working on very grade specific and building specific data um, in the meantime. So I'm gonna take the first section that talks about how flexible instruction is working for students overall. On a Likert scale of five, 30% of our parents rated a neutral or satisfied rating. 20% of the parents believed the flexible instruction was great so far. And at that time, 10% of our parents gave a very challenging rating. In terms of how much time students are spending on work, we broke that out by subject area. So for language arts, 64% of our parents reported that it's just enough time. Math had 61% of our parents reporting the same. For social studies, 47 parents of our, of our parents reported just enough time. And in science, very similar. So 49% said just enough time. In world language, we had some people for whom it did not apply, but for those for whom it applied, just enough time was 58%. And for special areas, the same is true. 49% of the parents reported just enough time. And for some of our students, that's an NA, it does not apply to them. We also had some similar results regarding the challenge level. So you'll see some very similar things. In language arts, 69% of the parents said it's the right amount of challenge. That was 62% for math, 53% for social studies, 53% also for science. In world language for whom it applied, they reported the right amount of challenge, 59%. And in the special areas or electives, in the case of the high school, 51% of the parents reported the right amount of challenge. In terms of adapting to technology, the parents reported a Likert scale of five, where 33% of the parents believed a five out of five that adapting has been very easy. And 19% of the parents said no label or neutral. 11% of the parents rated a one for five. Adapting has been very difficult. And that will be the type of thing we'll wanna look at in subsequent surveys because the learning curve potentially would have flattened by now and that accessibility and adapting to technology much, much, might be much easier now at that point. So we do wanna ask these questions repeatedly through our subsequent surveys. So one area drew my attention in particular and that was the open-ended comment section it quickly became clear that what was of concern for a lot of our parents was the lack of student to student and student to teacher interaction. So to address that concern, we have developed the next step in the distance learning model. And what we're looking at is interactive Zoom sessions. So I'm gonna give you some details on what we mean by interactive Zoom sessions and go through what that would mean for students. The interactive Zoom sessions would begin on Monday, March 4th. They will be posted the times and dates by Monday at 8 a.m. What we're looking for our elementary teachers to do is to engage for 15 to 30 minutes once per week in an interactive Zoom session. At the secondary level, we're looking, looking for 15 minutes per course or per prep once per week. So this interactive Zoom can take place during a teacher's office hours and they are not mandatory for students to attend and they do not count for any grade and they will not be recorded for privacy regulations. And what is an interactive Zoom? There are things like morning meetings. They can engage students in discussion about their work and lives. There can be social emotional learning activities, sometimes extra help. Um, an overview of upcoming assignments is a possibility. In terms of what 
we would like to um, see happen is for the students to start to feel comfortable engaging again online with one another. In this format, no new material would be taught as this would really disadvantage those students who are unable to attend due to their individual at-home circumstances. Teachers are expected to use the waiting room in Zoom to provide the safest environment for our students, and they will be developing ways in which they can have sort of Zoom rules so that there is appropriate behavior and appropriate responses if there is inappropriate behavior. I have really appreciated this opportunity to communicate directly to the Wallingford Swarthmore School community. And I wanna close by saying we are really living through something that is simply unbelievable and we are not likely to experience its equal in our lifetime. As a country, we have really reinvented everything we do from, from how we work to how we buy food and socialize and, and play and take care of our families and dream of when we can be a community again. We are really all too aware of the unmitigated pandemic conditions each family is living under, our staff included. And as we go into our seventh week of isolation, it is more important than ever to remember the truth about our WSSD community, that we are stronger when we stand together. We are at our best when we engage in productive feedback and conversations, and that we all want the very best imaginable for our students. Where we can make change, changes to the flexible instruction plan, we will continue to do so, and we will do so in thoughtful, carefully planned ways, and we will communicate it accordingly. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Citarelli Jones. Uh, we really appreciate the, the update to the board. I know uh, you and your team are working feverishly to continue to, to make changes and, and we very much appreciate all the hard work that everyone is putting into this. Um, I'll just remind board members, if you have a question, um, just click on the button so I can see that uh, you'd like to ask a question. Um, but I did want to, to ask two things. Um, one is, um, you know, the, the comment that you just made about um, not teaching new material um, on Zoom. And I'm wondering, you know, I think some students are um, still yearning a bit for like how to, how to get that teaching um, that's not just delivering materials and content, you know, um, you know, through Google Classroom and other means, but, um, you know, having that instructional uh, interaction with a teacher. So I'm wondering, um, you know, how, how we can move further in that direction, recognizing the challenges. And then the second question uh, has to do with whether or not there's any opportunity to rejuvenate any of the social activities um, that are part of school um, through Zoom or other means. Um, you know, I think we're rightfully heavily focused on a lot of uh, our core education uh, at the moment, but I think students are also missing all the other aspects of school. And so thinking, are there some aspects of clubs or other activities that could be rekindled in some way? Yeah, these are really great questions, Dr. Grandin. I'm, I'm happy that you're bringing them up. I think our first step into, I'll answer your first question for it's the best I can. Uh, I think the, the steps to move toward what you're describing, which is really synchronous learning, have to be thoughtfully planned out. And for the main reason of, we want to make sure that there is no disproportionality between what one student can get that advantages them in terms of new material learning and that another student would not get simply because they wouldn't have access, they wouldn't have the time, the ability, they have other responsibilities and it could be sickness, it could be um, parents out of a job. Um, so we have to keep those things in mind. In fact, we're required by law to keep those things in mind as we move forward to synchronous learning. Each week I meet with the curriculum directors in the county and this question about synchronous learning has come up each and every week of those meetings. And we have yet to have a school district say they have cracked the code on how to do this and still meet our legal obligations to make sure that there is equity among students. Our step into interactive Zoom is really putting the toe in the water. It's this idea of two-way interaction, whereas before it was one way, which means I might make a video, I might present that to students, students will look at it, I'm not talking to them directly. Even office hours can be considered two-way in that 
in that regard, but that's just answering specific questions. The idea of an interactive Zoom is gonna be a much more robust opportunity for interaction student to student and student to teacher. And where right now it's not direct instruction, we do see us having to move in that direction sooner rather than later. It's just a matter of doing it thoughtfully and carefully and making sure we're checking all the boxes that we are required to legally. Now, as for the second question about social activities, that's been part of our conversation right now as well. As a matter of fact, it's on our administrative council topic for tomorrow morning at 10. So one of the things that we are looking at is ways that we can revive some of our clubs and sports so that students at least a few times in May can have some meetings with, with their group and with their advisors so they can talk about what next year will look like or things that they've been up to. Um, that's part of what we think will really help our students feel connected again. So it's, it's now, turn to take a look at things that uh, along those lines and um, and we're really excited to do it. I, I have a senior at home right now. The number one thing he misses are his friends and and that interaction. So it constantly fuels me to keep it in the forefront of our thinking. Thank you. Uh, I see a couple of questions. So first, uh, Jen has a question. Hi, Jen. Uh, Jen, I think you're muted. Or maybe your hand went down. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. It, all's well now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is it the district's intention to keep the flexible learning going right up until the date when each school was scheduled to end? Uh, I think I understand your question to mean, will this plan as it exists now extend through the last student day? Am I getting that one right? Okay. Yes. Um, well, you know, we're looking at the flexible instruction plan as, well, flexible. Uh, so as we start to move closer and closer to other options, as technology becomes more robust, as we learn more about it, as the teacher learning curve on technology um, flattens out, uh, we think we're going to be able to take different steps. We think we're going to be able to fill in the gaps of some of the things that we feel that the initial flexible instruction plan was missing and be responsive to the parent surveys. So that's, it's our ongoing discussion is how do we continue to increase the learning? How do we continue to increase the student to student and student to teacher interaction? Um, and how do we dream of things we haven't yet dreamed of? We're going to be putting together an education committee specifically looking at what will May look like as we move further and further into May? What will our June weeks look like while we still have teachers here and not gone for the summer? And we'll be looking at what will the fall look like? And there are several different ways the fall could look um, and we would wait for the governor on that. But we have to imagine all of those different ways and be ready to go with any of them. So that education committee will have many members, a great cross section of people and um, and so we're going to start that thinking probably in the next week and a half once I get all of the members on board and we get some dates in mind. Okay, I think um, we have Damon next. Hi, Denise. Thanks for the Hi, update. Uh, <clears throat> uh, during the presentation, I noticed uh, when you're looking at uh, the, the respondents uh, about how easy it was to access information, I believe. I forget the exact wording, but we had 11% where it was difficult. And one hand, I, I'm like, oh, that's good. It's only about 11%. But on the other hand, that's a significant part of, of the school district of, of students that are having difficulty with uh, accessing like you know, electronic access or whatever. Uh, and sometimes like when uh, families are very fortunate enough to be have easy access to internet and, and be able to Get, uh, access all the assignments and everything. It's easy to think about how much that that they could be doing more. But my question to you is, uh, when when we look at the uh, the the amount of, of students that have difficulty at access, at what level do we think we can actually get that to? Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, and I'm bringing this slide up specifically because. Yeah. The language of it is important because it's not necessarily ask, asking about access. It's asking about adapting to the technology. So in some cases that could be accessing it because they're sharing one computer or that sort of thing. In some cases it's adapting to it. So learning Zoom, learning Google Classroom, learning Seesaw. And in the earliest stages, we talked about this at the last presentation, there were not 
as many early adopters of Seesaw as there were, let's say, Google Classroom at the high school. So that learning curve for the parents and for the students at those grades could be pretty high and could represent some of that 11%. So I think when we ask this question in a, in a subsequent survey, we'd have to look to talk about that access piece versus adapting to learning online. I think they're really two different questions. So I, I think it's probably worth our while to ask both of them. Well, I, I'm glad I misremembered the slide. So I, I, <laughs> those two things, but but this brings up a question. Uh, how, how does this uh, like uh, pair out when you look at grade level as it, I, I imagine just intuitively, it seems the younger grade level uh, adapting might be bit difficult, but at the at the high school where they already have Chromebooks, the, the adapting that might be a little easier. Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, what I think you're you're going to find is exactly what you predict to be true. I, I'm pulling up SRSs, for example, right now for this very same question for SRS. It was almost 17 percent of the students were had some trouble adapting to the technology. Um, and I think that sort of bears out. So what you're looking at here, of course, is the 11%. So it's averaging out with the high school that probably has a great number of people who are okay with it, all the way down to kindergarten one, two, who are the Seesaw users okay. probably struggled with it the most. So um, that's insightful and you're accurate. All right, thank you. Sure. Do we have any other Questions from board members? Okay, um, I did want to just ask one other question, um, and that's related to this uh, what sounds like a kind of hybrid solution at the high school regarding grading. Um, and I just wanted to ask, you know, what some of the, the reasoning was behind not going entirely to pass fail, but having this hybrid approach and giving students the option. Well, I think that, um, you know, there are some things that we had to try to keep in mind for students who are working really hard for their grades. You know, we're a block schedule. So the spring semester, our students really only got a third quarter, a third marking period. But that doesn't mean that the work that they did from that end of January to the March 12th date wasn't um, important and robust and that they didn't work hard. And so for those students for whom those grades are really gonna matter, say on their junior transcript. Um, because as I mentioned, we're, we're not positive that every college and university won't look into the, the GPA and they'll be okay with our um, understanding of what COVID did to student grades. In some cases having to do with scholarships and, and that sort of thing, grades could matter. And so we didn't want to steal that opportunity away from students who may just want the grade. They wanna sort of take the safe route and keep the grade and know that it's on their transcript, that's what it means, um, and that they can apply for their merit scholarships and sort of take a breath of relief that, that there is no worry about that. But for some students, our seniors in particular, I can think of, you know, many of them already have their post-secondary plans, whether it's college or the workforce, or they're going to um, different schools, different opportunities. For those students, the pass-fail might be a really great option. So we didn't want to steal that option from them either. And so we just thought that this was a way to put the choice into the hands of the students and the families, and that all of them are really okay and individual. Great. Well, um, you know, I, I think it it does seem to represent a good uh, hybrid solution. And we appreciate, again, uh, all the hard work that, that you and your team have put into this. Well, for that um, in particular, yeah. I will say that the high school administration just really excelled. They, they pulled together. They took data points. They thought it through. They called colleges and universities. They called the NCAA. They left no stone unturned with this decision. I, I really can't take a ton of credit for that. I, I like to put credit where credit is due. And our, our high school team led by Andrea Lapira has really been, I mean, just head and shoulders above what you can expect during this time. So the thanks goes to them. Great. All right, um, Dr. Palmer, shall we move on to our next presenter? We shall. We have for the next presentation, our technology lease refresh. And I have to compliment Ms. Figura, Mr. King, and Mr. Citroni, because it is so difficult to work on anything outside of our flexible learning 
And to take this much time and really look at what our needs were in terms of technology and carve out the time to actually solidify what our needs are. In this particular case, I will precede the presentation with this had been in the pipeline for a number of years, how we were looking at phasing in the one-to-one -one initiatives in the high school and also for the middle school. When we started at the high school, we started with one particular grade, and then we moved to the complete high school going one-to-one -one with our Chromebooks. We then were looking ahead, and this is going back three years, looking ahead for this particular year as the year where we would entertain uh, the one-to-one -one initiative for the middle school. What became very, very apparent was why the timing now was even more critical than it had been when we thought about it a number of years ago. And that's because of the need for devices for our kids and the need for standard devices for our kids in light of COVID-19. But we had planned this quite a number of years ago. So I know I see that our screen is queued up at this point for sharing, and I'm going to turn it over first to Mary Figura, who's going to lead the beginning of the presentation. So Mary, it's all yours. All right. Good evening. So on behalf of George King, AJ Citroni, and myself, we'd like to thank you for allowing us to present the technology lease refresh for the middle school one-to-one -one initiative for the 2021 school year. So this slide is an overview of tonight's presentation. We're going to review the current expiring lease information and the proposed leasing of Chromebooks as part of the one-to-one -one district Chromebook initiative at the middle school. Mr. King will be sharing the curricular expectations of the initiative and I will provide information regarding teacher professional development and training as well as how one-to-one -one devices promote student equity. We will end the presentation with some time for some questions. So this part of our screen, um, what we tried to do is show our 2016 original lease expiring versus the 2020 proposed computer lease with the one-to-one -one initiative at Strathaven Middle School. So to begin on the left-hand side of the slide is the lease where we had 515 laptops, 325 desktops, 17 charging carts with devices, 25 classroom computers, and 350 USB soundbars and monitors for a total of $666,973.50. So every four years, we look to renew our lease with either in-kind items or the tech department makes recommendations for changes to better suit the needs of our students. And this is based upon conversations that we've had with our administration and teachers. So this year, the lease fell perfectly with our proposed Chromebook expansion at the middle school, like Dr. Palmer said. We added a one-to-one -one at the high school a few years ago, and we had a large number of devices going back. And then this next phase, the district plan to supply the middle school with a large number of devices which were being returned. So on this right hand side, as you can see, as part of our proposed um, four year lease, we are reducing the number of laptops to 112, desktops to 286. We're keeping 25 desktops for Dan DeMara's Tech Ed Lab at Strathaven Middle School, purchasing 14 desktops to replace Steve Fisher's lab at Strathaven High School, and we're reducing our carts from 17 to 6 and maintaining our soundbar and monitor quantities. The big difference between the 2016 lease and the 2020 proposed lease are the 1,300 Chromebooks and licenses. 800 of these Chromebooks are being requested for the one-to-one -one initiative for student distribution at the middle school. Without the one-to-one -one initiative, we still would need 500 Chromebooks and licenses to be purchased to replace our current devices. The total 2020 lease with the one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative included is 724,000 
What I have at the bottom is the annual cost to our budget. So we have an annual lease from 2016, which is um, $166,743. And with this new proposed computer lease, we would be going to $181,012. That's a difference of $14,269. What we've looked at and um, kind of compared is the cost per middle school student to have this Chromebook opportunity would cost approximately $65 a year for each student. One of the things that we talked about too is from the cost of the initiative to the why. So there are three parts of the initiative that the team sees as essential. Mr. King is going to talk about the educational piece, the curricular expectations and opportunities for our students. I'm going to discuss a little bit later the professional development as part of instructional technology training and conclude again with student equity. So right now I'm going to hand over the rest of the presentation on educational curricular expectations to Mr. King. Thanks, Mary, and good evening, everyone. Um, we are very excited by the prospect of going one-to-one -to, -one to further enhance teaching and learning at Strathaven Middle School. Now that the teachers and students have been engaged in Google Classroom for almost a year now, we are seeing firsthand the benefits of having the capacity to access Google Classroom and other resources from both home and school. Prior to the closures, as Dr. Palmer had mentioned, um, we had surveyed each department at the middle school to garner feedback related to opportunities that one-to-one -one could provide in both in, in, in and out of school. There were three areas that commonly emerged, instructional opportunities, assessment and feedback, and then differentiation. So Mary, you can move over to instruction. So the first and foremost that came up the most from, from the staff was access to Google Classroom at home for every student. That was, that was the key component. Individual and collaborative learning enhancements. What we mean by that is if you were to go into any of our classrooms that already utilize Discovery Ed and Science and Social Studies, what is really special about that is students can access the learning right now at their level and then in those heterogeneous based classrooms, they can then share their learning with other students in the classroom at any different level. Um, and, and mention their continuity and discovery and science and social studies, they'll be able to access um, their labs and their simulations at both home and school. Student access to online text when it's appropriate in math and focus and world languages currently. And I put multiple locations there because um, we are too often asked by um, parents if we can have another set of textbooks. Um, it may be a situation where the family where mom and dad are not together and they want textbooks in, in both homes. We get that request often and we're finding it harder and harder to um, make that happen for our, our students and our parents. So for students to be able to access learning anywhere they are, if they're on vacation, if they're absent from school, it is huge for us. And language arts balanced literacy program, a key component of a balanced literacy program is a student's exposure to diverse digital literacy. Students will have greater access to online databases, both in and out of school. Can do that on, Mayor. <clears throat> the next section was assessment and feedback opportunities. Um, so what, what stood out here, according to the teachers, was the ability to better monitor student progress. And here's what they mean. In many cases, being able to give instant feedback to students, both in and out of school. Also, students access to online resources to provide help with key tasks um, and test quizzes. Oftentimes we hear um, parents mention study skills. Our, our, my student has trouble with that. Um, there are many wonderful online resources that help students prepare for that. So that would be another key benefit. And the next section was differentiation. You can move that slide, Mayor. So in the, in the DI category, um, currently our seventh and eighth grade teachers are 
just now completing a semester long training in differentiation. So along with the many key classroom strategies, there are also many online resources that would now be available for our students to access if they were to have Chromebooks at home. And um, so as we start to talk about these benefits and uh, I just, as I mentioned previously, our, our teachers at the middle school um, are just so prepared for one-to-one -one instruction right now. Um, having the year of Google Classroom was tremendously beneficial. I think one of the, the benefits to, um, if there is any silver lining to our current situation, is that they've really been able to hone their craft with working with students in a one-to-one -one setting. Um, it's not ideal right now, but it, it does show that, um, you know, with effort, our kids were prepared for this. And if they wouldn't have had that, those opportunities in the classroom prior to the closure, um, I think we would have been in, in a different situation. So I want to thank my staff, as um, Dr. Jones had, a, had mentioned about all the teachers in the district. I can't say enough about the, the spirit, the collaborative nature that I have seen over the past few weeks. Um, I'm in my sixth hour of Zoom meetings today. They can't meet enough. And, and really it's about, um, and I don't mind it because it's about connections. So I know that some fears about one-to-one -one in any school setting is that teachers and students would lose that connection with each other. And, and I think what this has brought forth to everyone is that we never wanna lose that, but it's too important. Face-to-face -face instruction can never be replaced by technology. Technology is simply used to enhance what we already do, to give kids other opportunities once they leave the brick and mortar school, um, to be able to access the classroom at any time. It's just a tremendous benefit. So um, I know those fears are there. Um, people who know me know I'm, I'm more of an old school educator. I'm gonna walk into a classroom and see a teacher engage with students. And that's what's important. And at the middle school level, it's a key component. It's about making connections with kids. And our teachers understand that. I see it every day. And what we, what we want to get out from one-to-one -one is that when it's right in the classroom, students can access learning at their level. Differentiation can happen. Assessment and feedback can be instantaneous. So these are, so these are just some of the key benefits that came out of our survey with the staff. There were so many more. Um, we could be here all night talking about the benefits. But I also want to, want to be cautious, too, to say that it's not who we are or what we want to do all the time. It's just something to enhance instruction. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary to talk about professional development opportunities, as well as the equity piece. Thanks, George. Mm -hmm. So going back to what George was saying, too, talking to the administration and the teachers, we've really talked about what this would look like at the middle school and kind of forming the vision. And one of the most important aspects of this is um, the teachers really felt professional development um, is something that um, would be part of that vision of how things would be accomplished and accomplished correctly. Um, you know, Basically, what came back from the teachers after we talked to them is they'd like to maintain student achievement and engagement through the integration of technology, incorporate technology with their teaching style and skill set. And also, the, the big part is, you know, we need that support with relevant training. So um, our plan basically is to have an intentional use for technology because instructional technology training seeks to understand the way people learn. Um, designing our tools and instructional systems tailored to our learning styles and hoping that teachers can improve how to efficiently instruct their students. That's really the main um, point of having um, instructional technology and being able to use those tools. So the teachers will be using technology to develop their teaching methods, managing projects, um, looking about um, refining their teaching methods around um, learning and assessment and evaluating work and instruction. The vision that the teachers kind of see this is to bring the learners, the teachers and our technical means together in an effective way. And it's really a lot to what George was saying. So speaking of relevant training, before school um, 
we left on the 13th of March, the middle school teachers were trained in Go Guardian, which is a safety tool to allow teachers to view and control student Chromebooks when they're in class. So the teachers can lock down the number of tabs or push out certain websites to students. So um, they've already gone through that safety piece and how they're going to use this in the classroom if it was a, a direct one-to-one -one, um, opportunity with devices in their classrooms. Having the uniform devices across the grade level, implementing new tools to enhance instruction um, and we'll build collaboration with staff and skills and with the students. It's impactful learning, basically. Um, and finally, I would just want to talk about the cost. Um, you know, this would cost money to be able to do some of these things. Well, the cost of training could be covered under Title II money, which is what I proposed. Title II money is basically money that we spend on professional development from through the federal programs. And also, if the PA SMART grant is available, uh, if they offer it again next year, we would also look at applying for the grant as an additional resource for using it for professional development. And then finally, the equity piece. Um, AJ probably could tell you a lot of our Chromebooks that went out this year uh, through the pandemic was, uh, most of them were from the middle school and elementary school. But uh, I think our highest numbers were at the middle school for this. And what we're looking at is allowing every student to have access to the same technology. Also giving um, students equitable access to digital resources and standards-based technology rich learning experiences. And we're also helping, hoping that the Chromebooks will engage students and balance opportunities with their digital tools. And the last bullet is really um, you know, we don't know what the future is going to hold. So as part of our emergency plan, middle school students like the high school students would have access to their own Chromebook for extended flexible learning. So like George was saying, opportunities for everyone. So Concluding our presentation, I'm sure there's some questions. So we're open to any questions. AJ is gonna support with anything that might have, um, as far as the leases in the past. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Mary and George for that. Uh, I see we have a question from Jen. Hi, Jen. You're muted, Jen. Thank you. I just wanted to get my screen back in check so I could see everybody. Um, Mr. King, I have a couple of questions for some, some um, statements that you made and then some that Mary made and then some questions that maybe anyone can chime in who knows the answer. I'm not sure who they would be directed towards. Um, Mr. King, the differentiation, uh, when you talk about the different websites that the kids could go to, um, is anyone that vets them first? And is there a list of district approved websites? Yes, great question, Jim, we, we do. Right now, we are learning about many through our DI training. So those sites are not out yet, but anything that is that we um, have in school and we would like students to replicate outside of school, we would have approved first. Okay, and would that be done before the Chromebooks were distributed? I would say before and during, because as we're going to learn more and more about different sites as they as they you know, are brought forth to us. Okay, and you said that the middle school teachers, um, aside from coronavirus emergency measures, were getting ready to prepare for one-on-one -on -one middle school Chromebooks prior to this. Uh, what were they doing to pre get prepared besides the Go Guardian uh, training? Yes, we, we had started discussions actually as early as January. We knew that we would potentially be the next phase in, in the rollout of, of Chromebooks. We weren't sure at that time it was going to happen or not. Um, so as we received word from Dr. Palmer that there was a chance um, that we would begin to explore that. So yes, GoGuardian was part of it. Um, but also the Google Classroom platform, getting students very acclimated to that in school was, is, is a big piece for what we want to do outside of school as well. 
because that, that's really our bridge between home and the school. Was there anything else they did to prepare? I, I, no. I think the classroom is at the elementary school as well. Yeah, and it just started there, but we, yes, we were, um, now there really isn't anything else you could do to prepare for Chromebooks. We have Chromebooks already in the building, so our kids have exposure to them. We have iPads, but we just have, we have a different array of materials and we don't have anything consistent. So we wanted a consistent platform for all of our kids that for both home and school. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, Ms. Figueroa, um, I asked this question at a prior school board meeting, which was how can a teacher have the responsibility of teaching a classroom and also supervising Go Guardian to see which kids are getting distracted and not paying attention? And the answer that I got is that everyone's responsible for doing their part. Um, it does not seem practical for middle schoolers who are famous for poor judgment. So is there something else that came up at the Go Guardian training that would allow, I mean, the idea seems fabulous, but the execution of Go Guardian as someone is also teaching seems complicated and a little bit unrealistic to me. What are your thoughts on that? AJ, can I defer to you? Because I know the Go Guardian what happened before I was here with the um, high school and then the middle school had it. Sure. Um, with, with Go Guardian, teachers can actually set up sessions prior to the class as well. So if they want them only to go to one website or a couple websites, they can actually set up what's called a session and put those particular websites into their classroom. And then the students can only go to those certain websites. So it all depends on how the teacher, how open the teacher wants their classroom while they're running the Go Guardian session. So there are ways to prepare before class. It's not just during class as they're using them, trying to watch their screens and, and monitor what they're doing during class. You can actually set up and prepare beforehand. And they're actually even doing that at the elementary school on some of their classrooms where they have smaller you know, only a couple of Chromebooks in the classroom, but I have seen teachers doing that with the smaller groups. Um, so it, it, you know, you could use it in the larger group to restrict down before class even starts. And it, it is also nice during class, if you do have that open where they can go to more websites where from their teacher screen, their desktop, they can watch all of the dis different screens at once just to get an overview. Uh, instead of having to walk around a room and kind of look at the screens, they could stand right at their computer and see all the screens at once, which is nice. Okay, that seems like a great execution of that platform. Um, I have not heard of that at our elementary school being made a lot of use of. Um, is that something that the middle school teachers are going to be encouraged to use? I understand they've been trained in that um, if they've had the comprehensive Go Guardian training, but that seems like a very good answer to how that should be executed. I hope that will be made good use of. The middle school definitely had a more in-depth training. We actually had a Go Guardian trainer come out and train um, the middle school staff. They also trained the high school staff earlier in the year, but they did uh, a training session with the middle school staff right before we left. That wasn't something that we have completely out there at the elementary school. So they may not know at all the elementary schools at all with all the teachers how to use all the different functions as much as the middle school or high school uh, would use it. And I think that maybe there is an assumption that when you get into the grades of the younger kids that that's less necessary, but I have learned that it's necessary all the way across the board. And I think that's important. There's and also a nice feature where you can black out their screens or completely um, take their screens away so that, you know, to get their attention back. So that, that also helps at the, the younger levels as well. And it's important to get out in front of it, I think. And I hope that this will be also passed on because it is, I mean, in a sense, the answer that I got before, which is that we're all asked to do our part, you know, this is a teacher and everyone should be, the teacher should be in control. And it really is asking, I mean, we wanna impose guidelines on the kids, but at some age it is sometimes asking too much to expect that they're not going to get themselves into some, some hot water without some good guidance and some firm boundaries. I think. Um, so I, I have a handful of questions uh, now uh, uh, to follow. Um, with the Chromebooks, obviously we're expecting that they're gonna be used if we choose to give them to the middle schoolers. Um, does anybody have a sense of how much school directed screen time is gonna be generated by the use of the Chromebooks? 
I, I don't have any hard data on that right now, but I can, what I can assure you, Mrs. Lentz, is that um, our philosophy at the middle school is not gonna change. We, we look all the time for any resources to help enhance what we do instructionally. And the Chromebook is just that. It's enhancement to what we do. And it's a way for a student to access information at their level. So we're gonna stay with that philosophy. And if it ever goes in another direction, then there are conversations that I will have with my staff. But knowing them, these they are going to be very easy conversations because they know right now a student's just not going to walk into a math class and open your Chromebook like you would a textbook. That is not the intent. The intent is solely to support what we are doing. And then when they go home, to just bridge that gap and have that learning occur right in their own home, the same as it would in the classroom or, or close. So as a parent, um, and I actually will have a sixth grader next year. So speaking for myself, but also other parents that I know, is it fair that parents can envision the classroom um, as the Chromebook being just one piece? And like you said, that not going in and opening that up for every single class as an assumption? Absolutely. That, okay. that, is, that is what, in, you know, in fairness to my staff, this is going to be new to them. In some classrooms, our social studies and science classrooms, not so much because they've had the Discover Ed program for a few years now, and they've been utilizing Chromebooks in their classrooms. But for our other content area teachers, there's gonna be a learning curve. And that's where that professional development piece came in that Mary was speaking about. And then there's gonna be our own learning in the middle school about what, what that right balance is. But when it comes to social media, when it comes to online learning, we consistently have that talk with our kids about balance at the middle school. We've had speakers come in to present on those topics and that's what it's all about, use of their phone. We also talk about quality versus quantity of time. Um, many of our students you know, just unfortunately go home and their time is spent on their phone. So it's not quality time that they're interacting with technology. I wanna turn that around and have a Chromebook in their hand where they can actually do what they're supposed to. And I can't say they're, they're not gonna go on their phone but I know at least that they did have some quality screen time that night. Um, but that, that's a major problem at the middle school and the high school as well, as far as that balance of quality and quantity. Can I jump in a little bit and add to this? Sure. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind. So, you know, I, I've worked in middle schools for a really long time and the philosophy in, in education there is really about experiential learning. It's students are very, very hands-on at the middle school level. Um, they almost won't tolerate constant screens because it doesn't stimulate them in the same way that the actual holding of things and moving of things. Our English language arts, for example, those books are all in classroom libraries. So kids are getting their books and sitting with the book, the smell of a book, the feel of the book, all of that. And they're delving in, they're writing jots on stickies that go into the book. And those books at the end look like, you know, these really almost... Um, like puzzled through works of literature. It's really great to see. In our science classrooms, they're doing labs that are very physical labs that you can sometimes have a virtual lab, but it is not the same thing. And so it's important that we continue those things. In social studies, we are doing simulations all the time. We're simulating events in history. We are doing debates. These are things that you can't do online. Um, we're also talking about things in world language where there's a lot of speaking and listening activities that happen and cultural appreciation. You're not getting that on a computer. We have students who are learning about wood shop and metal shop in their tech ed. They're doing robotics in tech ed. Their computer science classes, of course, their screens, but even they are doing shark tanks and entrepreneurships and actually making the models of things. I think especially at the middle school, we have no worry about an overabundance of screens as the mode of instruction. Those teachers love and they know the kids love all of that experiential hands-on learning. Okay, that, that is helpful, thank you. Um, do you, I've heard about a lot of the benefits. Do you see any risks or downsides to each kid having a Chromebook? Mr. King, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, right now we've been weighing all the pros and, and I know the cons are going to, they're going to appear. And just speaking to the high school, you know, you do have the kids who leave them at home. Um, they break. The kids are coming in unprepared, they don't have it. So you have to have systems set in place to make sure that every kid has access to one when they come in the morning, whether they brought it from home or not. Um, but I, I haven't heard too much on, on the side of the cons for that, other than some of the logistics of Chromebooks and, and getting them to and from school. Pretty much 
what we same situation we have with textbooks with kids forgetting things. Um, so it, it may help them a little bit more with organization if they don't have to take as much home in their book bag every day from Strathaven Middle School or from the high school. Um, but you know, I it's just going to be that consistency in the classroom that we're going to have to really be you know, to monitor to make sure, as you had mentioned, to make sure that we are striking that balance with all the experiential learning that Dr. Jones just mentioned. Um, I never want anyone just to rely you know, solely on, on the Chromebook. And as Denise said, I don't think we have any issue with the middle school staff going that way. Um, but I'm sure there are going to be things that I don't know are going to happen right now. And, um, but we'll be prepared and we'll make a plan and we'll address it when it does happen. Have you, and uh, I'm not sure who this is best to answer, but have you seen improvements in the education of the high schoolers since they went one-to-one? -one? or achievements, in the, especially in the core subject areas? Do you want me to take this one? Yeah, so I, I don't know that we've collected hard data on whether it's improved, but I, I'm gonna second what George has said in that it's not the educational tool, it's a supplement to all the other educational tools that we, um, we employ at the high school. Uh, for us, you know, I think it's really, been helpful for students to be able to use Google Docs and to have that interactive feature with their teachers when they're producing work. Um, and the Go Guardian has supported, you know, the uh, appropriate use of it. So I don't, I don't have any hard data on on your question, but I think whenever we bring uh, an instructional tool into the high school to supplement student learning. It can only help, and I think our teachers, you know, having had a couple of years of experience with it, um, it's it's the same thing as anything else. It's a classroom management piece that our teachers, you know, focus on when you know when it's important to have the Chromebooks out, they're out. When it's not important to have them out, they're tucked away. Okay, um, is it possible to survey the outgoing seniors to see what their opinions have been on them and what sort of use, good, bad, or neutral, they've made of them? Yeah, that's easy enough to do. Absolutely. I mean, they, they certainly wouldn't have a reason to be anything but forthright since they're leaving this school, I would, I would think. Um, and um, I guess the reason I'm asking about the cons is because I have read a lot of different articles that do clearly list cons, but... Um, Without getting into that, I'm also wondering if there's a parent who has a reason to believe that the Chromebook is impacting their child negatively, either through their education or otherwise, would there be an alternative method for them to um, receive the same level of education from the individual teachers related to their child? A absolutely. They would, if, if a parent, and a, if that's a decision a family makes that they don't want to have access to a Chromebook either at school or at home, um, or if there's a technology plan that you would like put in place for any parent with their child, they just need to let us know and it will not impact them at all. Okay. Um, also wondering, and the, AJ, these might be better questions for you, although I don't mean to discount anyone's technical knowledge, so don't feel excluded. Um, websites like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, are they accessible from these Chromebooks for the kids? No, so the, the Chromebooks are filtered at school and at home the same way. So we'll start with YouTube. YouTube is accessible, uh, but we have that filtered where only links that are submitted by staff members are allowed for student viewing. So they can't just go to YouTube and search anything and scroll through the home page of videos and you know click through all the different links of videos down the side. The, the videos actually need to be submitted by teachers for us to allow them for students. As far as any of the uh, other websites, the Facebook, Instagram, anything that's social media, that's already blocked. That's blocked by our filter and it'll continue to be blocked. Um, anything that's not educational, you know, th there's always websites that come out. If anything is out that isn't blocked, it takes, you know, one email to our help desk and we block that link. And again, that's, that's instant. It doesn't take um, time for that to, to happen. As soon as we, we are aware of a website that needs to be blocked, we block it. And if, and the opposite, if there's a website that's blocked, that shouldn't be blocked, we can unblock it because it's, it's all done by an algorithm, by the filtering company that we use 
Um, but we do have the ability to categorize any website any way we want. Okay, so is there also a way instead of getting the email to get out in front of it with some of the sites that you said, you know, and I know are coming up all the time um, going forward? Yeah, we, we don't have to wait. So if a teacher knows of a website, they let us know. We, you know, we have teachers all the time email and say, hey, we're going to use this website next week for class. Can you please make sure it's not blocked? And, and we, we put it in and we can see what the category is and, and change the category ahead of time. So yeah, it's not something where we need to wait until something happens. We can change categories for websites at any minute. I'm thinking about more getting out in front of the slimy websites or even the, not the slimy websites, but the ones that really don't offer any productive value that kids may be interested in, but parents are probably not interested in having them go on. The filter company that we use is the number one filter used by schools in the United States. And like I said, there's an algorithm that they run through their websites and have mainly all of the websites already categorized. If there's something categorized as unknown and the filter company doesn't know what it is, it's blocked. So if the fil our filter company doesn't know what the website is, something new came out and it doesn't have a category for it, it's already blocked. So, you know, as people are coming up with new websites that may not be educational, they're blocked. If there's a new web website that is, our filter does a really good job of categorizing stuff without us having to interact with it ahead of time. I know at times that company has not been infallible. So I'm just wondering if there's also an uh, internal way that there could be some periodic checks, maybe something to consider going forward. Um, they're probably good, but I don't know if they're, you know, and they may be the best, but I don't know what that means sometimes. Sure. Um, yeah. Yep. I think I just have one more. Thank you everyone for being patient with me. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. All right. I think we have a question from Damon. I just wanted to follow up. Uh, to that last conversation, uh, when my oldest two, which are twins, they're freshmen in high school, when they got their Chromebooks, they were disappointed about how little they could actually do that they thought they would be able to do outside of uh, the classroom with it. Hmm. In terms of fun things, you know, or with yes. <laughs> good Positive disappointment, yes. I, I see good. what you mean. Uh, and then I think I see Kelly has a comment. I was actually going to echo kind of the same thing that um, having had, you know, I have two in the high school um, and through the lab, sort of the lab and the carts um, when they were available in the middle school, um, you know, to, there's things can always happen for sure. Um, my, my own experience is that um, same thing. They don't. Uh, they use them at home only for the purpose of doing their homework because they cannot access anything else that they want to access through them. Um, and in the middle school, we did actually have uh, one incident when my son was uh, using one when he wasn't supposed to be, and it resulted in an immediate um, disciplinary action and a phone call to me. So. I, I can say that the, from my personal experience, the school is very, very on top of that and the teachers are as well. And we find it very, very useful as a parent because I have to watch uh, closely what is getting turned in and then I can go in and see very closely what exactly is occurring through uh, Google Classroom using the Chromebook. So I find it very helpful for that. All right, are there any other board members who have any questions before we move on? All right, um, I wanna thank our presenters. Certainly, um, you know, I think the discussion highlights some of the complexities of how we deploy technology. I think, um, you know, Jen brings up a lot of uh, important concerns as we think about deploying technology and making sure we're making good use of it in terms of advancing educational goals. At the same time, I think we're facing a uh, upcoming year where we want to be prepared uh, for what might come. And I think that these uh, Chromebooks can certainly put us in a better position to handle uh, any potential disruptions over the next year. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Um,
So that takes us uh, to the next part of our agenda where we typically have um, time for audience recognition for items for action on the agenda. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the mechanism to do this uh, for this meeting as well as future remote meetings uh, is to uh, call 610-892-3470 extension 1102 to leave a recorded comment, again, subject to a three minute time limit. Um, anybody can leave a comment uh, until the end of the meeting, uh, and we certainly encourage that. Um, I wanna uh, double check with Ms. Klingerman. Um, I don't believe we had any comments before five o'clock today. Is that, is my understanding correct? Yes, Dr. Grandy, there were, there were no comments before 5 p.m. today. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so that takes us to our first uh, item for action for approval, which is the minutes from the April 13th regular business meeting. Uh, I so move. Uh, do we have a second? Chapin Samino, second. Thank you, Chapin. Uh, any discussion on that item? Okay. Uh, Ms. Klingerman, can you please, please take a roll call vote? Yes. Ms. Samino? Um, aye. Dr. Downey? Aye. Dr. Huff? Aye. Mr. Cutis? Aye. Mrs. Lentz? Aye. Mr. Orsetti? Aye. Mrs. Walkman? Aye. Mr. Ballas? Aye. And Dr. Grandy? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. The item passes uh, nine to zero. So that takes us to personnel. Uh, we have four items for action and personnel this evening. Uh, are there any items on the list anyone on the board would like to separate? Okay. Uh, we have the approval of four appointments. Uh, first, Brian Picknally, health and phys ed teacher at the middle school. Uh, Courtney Aaron, a media specialist at SRS. Shelby Harper, a fourth grade teacher at NPE. And as Dr. Palmer uh, announced earlier, Gregory Hilden, a uh, new principal at the high school. Um, next, we have the approval of 11 changes of assignments as stipulated in the agenda uh, under item B. Uh, then we have the approval of two changes of assignment as stipulated in the agenda under, under item C, uh, which Dr. Palmer described earlier, which includes uh, Dr. Sotorelli Jones as Director of Education and AJ Centroni as Network and Site Services Administrator for Technology. Then we have the approval of one curriculum supplemental appointment, uh, Dawn Dankinich as a grade chairperson for kindergarten for the 2019 2020 school year. And again, all of these items are as attached or described in the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Is that Jerry? Yes. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, do we have a second? Second, Michelle Downey. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, any discussion? Yes, I have a question. Do we know when the uh, new high school principal will be able to join us? This is Ferg Abbott. Greg will be starting with us on July 1st. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, Ms. Klingerman, can you take a roll call vote, please? Yes. Dr. Downey? Aye. Dr. Huff? Aye. Mr. Cutis? Aye. Mrs. Lentz? Aye. Mr. Orsetti? Aye. Mrs. Walkman? Kelly Walkman? I, I. Thank you. Mr. Ballas? Aye. Ms. Amino? Aye. And Dr. Grandy? Aye. Thank you. All right, the items pass nine to zero. Mm -hmm. Before moving on to the curriculum, I will mention that I really look forward to when we meet in person again. Um, 
So we have seven items for action and curriculum. Um, are there any on the list that anyone would like to separate from the rest? Okay. Uh, first, we have the approval of the 2019-2020 school year related service provider contracts as stipulated. Uh, second, we have the approval of four educational services agreements as listed in item B, C, D, and E in the agenda. Uh, we have the approval for the administration to waive specific graduation requirements for any student who is enrolled in academic or other learning opportunities for the spring of 2020 that would have permitted such a student to graduate in June 2020 and the administration reasonably expected the student to graduate at that time. We have the approval of changes to Wallingford Swarthmore School District grading practices through the end of the 2019-2020 school year. The administration is directed to create guidelines for implementing these changes and publish them on the district's publicly accessible website by May 4th, 2020. These changes are listed in the agenda, but in summary, uh, as we heard earlier at the high school, across all subject areas, letter grades will be given. Students will have the option to convert letter grades to pass fail grades with consent of a parent guardian. Uh, at the middle school, across all core subject areas, letter grades will be given. In special areas, students will receive pass-fail grades only. And then at the elementary school, teachers will assign progress updates to parents to indicate a two, moving toward grade level expectations, or three, meets grade level expectations. And in special areas, students will receive pass-fail grades only. All the items in the section are as attached or described in the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved, Michelle Downey. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, do we have a second? Lawrence Q to second. second. Uh, I think we have Larry there for a second. Um, any discussion? Okay. Uh, Ms. Klingerman, can you please take a roll call vote? Uh, yes. Dr. Huff, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Cutis. Aye. Mrs. Lentz. Aye. Mr. Rossetti. Aye. Mrs. Walkman. Aye. Mr. Ballast. Aye. Ms. Semino. Aye. Dr. Downey. Aye. Dr. Grandy. Aye. Thank you. All right, the items pass nine to zero. We move on to finance. We have 16 items for approval in finance. Are there any on the list the board would like to separate from the rest? Okay. Um, so bear with me, I'll, I'll read through them all. Um, we have the approval of payment of invoices to vendors from April 4th to April 17th, 2020. Acknowledgement of receipt of financial statements for March 2020 is stipulated. We have the approval of the treasurer's report for March 2020. We have the approval of 2019-2020 budget transfers as stipulated. We have the approval for Fox Rothschild to enter into an agreement for the property at 101 Chesley Drive, setting the assessment at $831,900 for tax year 2020 and for each subsequent tax year until a change in the assessment pursuant to applicable law as described in the agenda. We have the approval of the retainer hourly rates and other services as submitted by Jeffrey Sultanic from Fox Rothschild LLP effective July 1st, 2020 as detailed in the March 9th, 2020 proposal in terms of engagement. We have the approval of the HIPAA business associate agreement between the district and Fox Rothschild LLP as a result of Fox Rothschild handling cases that involve protected health information on behalf of the district. We have the approval of the second food services renewal contract with the nutrition group as described in the agenda. We have the approval of the public education agreement with Synovia Solutions to provide GPS locator locators for the student tra transportation fleet at an annual cost not to exceed $15,252. This cost is based on 41 vehicles and will be adjusted based on the actual number of vehicles in the district's fleet. We have the approval of the TransFinder Market Connect proposal to provide data integration with the Synovia Solutions GPS system at an annual cost not to exceed $2,560. We have the approval of the resolution authorizing a loan through the Delaware Valley Regional Finance Authority pool program 
for the purpose of refinancing the district's outstanding general obligation bond series A of 2012 to achieve debt service savings. With the approval of the Dell Financial Services lease proposal dated April 13th, 2020 as stipulated, final documents being subject to solicitor review. We have the authorization to enter into agreement with Crabtree, Rohrbaugh and Associates to perform architectural services related to entrances at the high school as stipulated. We have the approval to enter into agreement with the SJ Thomas Company Incorporated to replace the SRS main lobby and vestibule flooring as indicated in the description of project and scope of services at a cost not to exceed $35,000. We have the approval to enter into agreement with SJ Thomas Company Incorporated to replace the high school modular classroom flooring as indicated in the description of the project and scope of services at a cost not to exceed $160,000. And finally, we have the approval of the 2020 Visual Media LLC contract to provide high school graduation video production services at a cost not to exceed $7,250 pending solicitor's review. All of these items are as attached or described in the agenda. Do I have a motion? So move, Chapin Sanito. Thank you, Chapin. Do I have a second? Second, Kelly Walkman. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Ms. Klingerman, can you please take a roll call vote? Yes. Mr. Cutis, how do you vote? Uh, Thank you. Ms. Mrs. Lentz? Aye. Mr. Rossetti? Aye. Mrs. Wachtman? Aye. Mr. Ballas? Aye. Ms. Semino? Aye. Dr. Downey? Aye. Dr. Huff? Aye. Dr. Grandy. Aye. Okay, the items passed nine to zero. Um, so that takes us to audience recognition for response to topics not on the agenda. Um, and Ms. Klingerman, as you mentioned earlier, I don't think we received uh, anything before five o'clock. Is that correct? No, we haven't, Dr. Grandy. Okay, thank you. Um, so that takes us to old business. Do we have any old business? Jen. Thank you. I just had two items to address. Uh, the first one is just to request that if the board is going to have to approve any uh, future contracts related to any um, tech platforms, if we could be given more specific results of the flexible learning survey as they apply. And, my, and the second item of old business is that um, the new, I know the school has worked so hard to see how much reimbursement either monetarily or otherwise uh, families could receive for trips, which is wonderful. Um, are the families going to be informed of the status? And will the families of the middle school Quebec City and Costa Rica trips be informed that our solicitor is working uh, on this for them? Will they get that notification? Uh, Lisa, are you able to, to answer that question? I'm actually going to lob that one over to Mr. King. He and I have talked about this, so I am not sure at what point they are already informed about that. The, they know that we were looking into it, but they are not informed that the solicitor is looking into this. It, they're not informed at that level, Lisa. So if um, that's something you would like my chair to uh, address tomorrow, we could get that word out to the parents that it pertains to. That would be perfect. Okay, not a problem. Great, thank, thank you for the follow-up and all you did for that. You're welcome. Any other old business? Okay, do we have any new business? Okay, um, hearing none, uh, thank you very much for- uh, I have everyone. new business. Oh, who was I that, Simon? Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, yes. That's I, okay. I missed the hand. All right. All right. It, this might be slightly frivolous, but uh, <laughs> one thing is missing in a lot of the students during, during this quarantine time, during this pandemic, is students that actually have their birthday during the quarantine. I say this firsthand because it's my youngest son's birthday today. First, I want to say happy birthday, Fenton. But I also want to say, you know, for all students who are, who are missing, especially in elementary school, because it's a big deal to have that experience where you're in a school and people sing to you. I'm not going to sing, I promise, is I want to wish happy birthday to any kids out there who have missed their birthday celebration in school during the quarantine. 
We're thinking about you. Happy birthday. Thank you, Damon. And thank you for uh, reminding us of some of these important milestones that I think, uh, unfortunately, our students keep missing out on. And hopefully, um, they won't keep missing out on them in the future. But uh, thanks for that shout out to our, to our kids. Uh, any other new business before we adjourn? I will pay attention to the hand feature going up. All right, seeing none. Again, thank you everyone for uh, participating and thanks for the helpful presentations this evening. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>